Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amanda Carl. I'm part of the IBM Research Communications team, and I'll be your host today. We're looking forward to a lively discussion about the future of quantum software development. This panel is actually the first in a series of panels related to quantum computing that we'll be hosting throughout the summer. Uh, before we get started, though, I did just want to acknowledge the new virtual reality we find ourselves in in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we hope each of you is safe and healthy wherever you are. With that said, uh, I do want to take a quick minute to run through a couple of items and reminders for today's discussion. Uh, throughout the event, you'll have the ability to submit questions for the panelists. If you'd like to address a specific panelist, please indicate who your question is for. You should see a little Q&A window on your screen, and that's where you can submit your questions. We definitely encourage you to submit your questions throughout the panel discussion, and we'll save the last 10 minutes or so to address as many as we can. Uh, for any questions we don't get to uh, or follow-ups that are required, please just work with your IBM representative, and we will get back to you and arrange time with some of the panelists afterwards. Within the next 24 hours, we expect that we'll be able to share the playback of the event and we'll also send over to each of you via email any other relevant resources related to today's talk. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to today's moderator, Forrester's Jeffrey Hammond, Vice President, Principal Analyst Serving CIO Professionals. Jeffrey? Thanks, Amanda. It's great to be here today. So as I've been starting to look at quantum technology, it's really been Interesting. I've been in the application development space for almost 30 years now as a developer, have built developer tools, and for the last 14 years I've been at, at Forrester Research writing for application developers and, and software professionals. And for those of us that are in the enterprise, a lot of times we view the relentless march of software technology is just something that we deal with and we learn about. And you know, we get new disruptive changes, whether it's mobile or the or the cloud or or AI, and we deal with them, we figure them out, and then we use them productively. Um, it's easy to look at quantum that way and say, hey, it's just another long string of technologies uh, that that we have to deal with and learn. But when you dig into it and start to look at it, there's also the idea that it might be a pretty disruptive change. I mean, a major change in the way that developers have to think about technology and, and work with it. And so one of the things I'm hoping to do uh, today for my own edification is to unpack some of that with folks who are far smarter than I am uh, with respect to quantum technology, uh, but I think are able to, to bring it down uh, to the level of an enterprise developer or an executive uh, that is running a large business. So with that, I'd like to start uh, with introductions. And why don't we go to you first, Dr. Narang. Pri, would you like to, to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, thank you for having me here. My name is Praneha Narang. Almost no one calls me that, so you're welcome to call me Pri. Um, I am on the faculty here at Harvard, and I'm also the CTO and co-founder of Alira. So excited about all things quantum and excited to, to tell you about some of them here today. Thanks for being here. Now, I know our second guest today because I met him years ago uh, when we were both talking about mobile application development technologies. Worley, you want to say hello and tell me how the heck you got from building iPhone applications to running a company that is looking at, at quantum uh, uh, ap applications of technology. Hey, that's great. So I'm Worley. I'm the founder and CEO of StrangeWorks. Uh, it's, it's simple. Uh, Jeffrey, I see this in the same way I saw, if you think back to that iPhone dev camp, where we got everybody together a week after it came out, um, you know, with the uh, 400 or so developers and Steve Jobs at the time saying there'd be no apps, there'd be no stuff. I see this changing even more dramatically, all areas of science and research and, and our livelihoods, uh, just like we saw. And it's, by the way, it's the same team uh, that, that did the last two companies, just like we saw the the, the mobile stuff um, all the way back in 2006, 2007, uh, before there were app stores or anything. And so, I think there's 23 million developers worldwide, and I'd like to democratize this as much as possible, make it accessible to to everyone, so that uh, you know we're not going to try to win a Nobel Prize with any quantum stuff. We're not going to ever probably be recognized for any uh, you know the very small quantum talent we have, but we might be a catalyst for everybody else, and that's that's my focus. So I'm bringing all of the Linux Foundation, Apache, Nagios, iPhone Dev Camp, all of that kind of stuff 
to to quantum in an effort to fulfill that. Cool. Well, we're glad to have you here today. Um, our last uh, panelist today is, is, is Blake Johnson. Uh, Blake, you want to say hello? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, putting this together. So I'm Blake Johnson. I am the, the lead of control systems area at IBM Quantum. Um, I'm a relatively recent uh, IBMer, just joined last year, but I've been working on quantum computing uh, essentially my entire adult life. Uh, and control systems is an interesting area, particularly because it is, it is uh, immediately points to one of the areas that quantum technology is different from, from classical processors because uh, in your classical processor, your control and your and your bits are co-located and the quantum processors, at least the ones we build today, uh, these things are separated by many meters of cable. Uh, so my team is responsible for effectively executing the quantum program, which means converting uh, the user, the developer's intent of what they want to happen into the electrical signals that 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 make that happen on the on the qubits themselves. So if I had to grossly simplify, you build the digital to quantum uh, converters. That's right. It's we're at the we're at the, we're at the classical to quantum interface in, in some ways uh, to uh, orchestrate um, all the electrical signaling that needs to happen to to make the the quantum compute work. Cool. So when I think about a technology like this that is potentially so disruptive, uh, as a developer, I look for, for hooks and I look for patterns and I look for ways to kind of translate what I know um, to the new world. And, and, and hopefully I can find something that helps me understand it a little bit better. And so for my first question, I wanna start with you, Blake, because I noticed in, in your history, you've worked with, with quantum programming languages. So. I know programming languages, at least a few. Um, what is a quantum programming language? Is it just Python with a few set of libraries or is there something that is distinct to that space? And so as a developer, what do I have to know to be able to use a quantum programming language? Um, it's a great, great question. So my colleagues recognizing that there was something maybe intimidating about quantum uh, when they first started, uh, chose to develop first a, a graphical interface, a graphical drag and drop way to build quantum circuits where the, where the kind of the fundamental unit of quantum compute. Uh, so that uh, is available today in the IBM quantum experience where you can drag and drop uh, gates, which are the, the logical operations that manipulate qubits, which are quantum bits, uh, to build up uh, a program. Um, but uh, it's, it's a great way to learn, and it's you can kind of get intu intuition about uh, how a, qu a quantum circuit uh, operates with that way. But for for more um, real tasks, uh, you need a real programming interface. And so we we have a Qiskit, which is an open source uh, quantum computing framework um, developed at IBM, which is a Python interface for for building uh, quantum circuits and for building. Uh, algorithms uh, that, that take advantage of quantum processors. Why why is Python a, a preferred language for, for for quantum programming? Are there other 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 options as well? Um, pre Whirly. Pre. Um, I, 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 all right. So. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Go ahead. No, please you. <laughs> all right. So. I think as we're, we're thinking about you know programming uh, various different quantum computers, part of uh, I, part of what I like about Qiskit is that it's very very accessible. I find students asking me, "Hey, how do I go in and, and do something uh, complicated sounding?" But but if it's just Python, I can you know uh, get in there and and make something happen. I think the challenge is uh, with that abstraction, you lose a lot of the control over the actual hardware. So maybe you you don't necessarily have um, all of the the tools that'd be available if you could directly program uh, the the system. So the pulse level control that IBM has made available is certainly uh, a good way to bridge that. I wonder if as we go towards other types of hardware, not just superconducting circuits, how some of the programs that are written for superconducting circuits would be translated to those. And if everything is not based off of the same uh, pulse level uh, control scheme, what, what would be uh, a good way of, uh, of translating? And I don't have an answer to this, so maybe Worley does, but uh, but yeah, that's just something I wanted to add, building on uh, what Blake just said. No, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, our approach is, of course, is to 
let all of the languages battle it out. Um, we're big Kiskit fans. I say that not because we're on IBM, but when we first started, same reason. There was there was already a community. There's tons of people working with it. We're big supporters um, slash soon to be making our first contributions to it. Uh, but I think, you know, we have to focus when you think about developers and you think about you, you can't take a developer and make them a quantum developer overnight. If you go back when I first launched a company in 2018, I got on the stage at South by and that was the goal. And, you know, about six months later, that goal was much harder. And about a year into it, it was like, there's just some things that are fundamentally different. So for example, uh, if I'm programming on any other platform that's possible in the world, and I run into that error like you described, Jeffrey, and I say, oh, I, I've got an error with this, I, I can find it or I know how it works. Whereas, you know, what we see happen with developers coming over is they get in and they can instantiate a teleportation thing through Microsoft Katas or IBM Kiskit or whatever, and then the moment it breaks, if they don't understand the you know fundamental physics behind it, then they're kind of at a dead end. Right. Um, so, so it's so it's very. Kind of, so it's kind very of sounds different. like low code developers when they try to use low code tools and they break out of the <laughs> right. out of the machine. You know. Uh, both of us got that, Jeffrey. But do, 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 but um, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it, it it is. And so so I think you know our approach has been to build a spanning layer across hardware and software that's agnostic. So, you know, Pre could put solutions in it, you know, Blake and his team could say, oh, here's a pulse control, whatever, to kind of kind of, you know, let the the the, the technologies kind of float to the top. And and this is what we've seen in our history, right? This is what you saw when the NCSA was gonna like, we're gonna make a web server that costs $5,000. And Apache was like, no, we're gonna give one away for free. And I've, development communities build. Um, and sometimes you have conflict, right? I mean, IBM had Watson and, and Google's battle was to try to take all these developers from, you know, and put them in TensorFlow to, to, to build that as a solution. So, you know, we're trying to be a little bit more Switzerland. We see everybody in the space as, as collaborative. And as far as developers go, I just think it's really no, it's the programming language question and what tools are becoming popular is important, but it's important to realize there's 23 million developers in just like Apple's ecosystem. There's probably 40 million worldwide. Right. And when you think of the enterprise, there's a much bigger gap than, oh, are you using Python or, you know, some other language or whatever. I mean, there's there's a fundamental relearning and retooling that developers are going to have to do in order to take advantage of these machines. So so, so let's poke at that. As, as I was looking at it, and again, this is, I'm, I'm a guy who, you know, when I dig into it and the first thing I see is, oh, you, you know, here's, here's some linear, linear algebra for you. I'm like, okay, <laughs> didn't have that in, that in college. So <laughs> this may be a little challenging, but, you know, one of my takeaways was that for the last 50 years, we've essentially been thinking in zeros and ones in digital computing, you know, essentially two states. And fundamentally what we're going to is what, 26 states in, in the qubit or something like that. So, so you know, is it essentially moving, re, reimagining computing as we know it and moving away from the fundamental digital technology here so that eventually we don't have these digital to quantum converters anymore? and we have a domain specific language that understands how to write these circuits, is it that big of a change or, or is, it, is, is, is it simpler than that? I think it's a bit simpler than that. I mean, still fundamentally, when you read out a qubit, you still get a binary answer, right? So th there's right. still zero and, zeros and ones in the interface. But the state of the, state of the world today, when you go to use a quantum computer is, is kind of like the, the, the analog analogy to classical computers, someone wanted to do classical programming, and someone handed them an electrical engineer textbook saying, this is how you put together flip-flops and latches to build a NAND gate. Right. Yep. <laughs> you don't need to know that to program, but that's kind of where we start with quantum computing. We need to exit that model, right? Yeah. So, so abstraction yeah. is key. Right. There are yeah. also, I think, a lot of things that are... Um, you know, not yet possible with hardware, but we take for granted in, in classical computing. So, you know, thinking about conditional statements and intermediate measurements, not something that is trivial to do in a, a quantum circuit at the moment, certainly not in a superconducting circuit, but that's uh, uh, going to be very important to write more complex quantum programs in, in future. And yeah, I, I, as those advances come from the hardware side, what we think about is how do you translate those into something that um, you can use on the on the software side, and then it's not so obvious how you take advantage of, say, intermediate measurement, or or how you use the fact that you know you you might have a, a very large circuit, but you could train on a smaller circuit and then use that to know something about this larger circuit. There's there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff 
uh, could be done, but is is not yet done. So. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think you know. I... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. I was just gonna say. I mean, I think you know you have to realize where we're actually at. We're not in the days of AMD versus Intel. We're in the days of like little mechanical gates versus like vacuum tubes and other solutions. And so, you know, these things aren't computers in, you know, from from my like kind of pure developer standpoint uh, at the moment in time, they're really great equipment for exploring the quantum landscape that are the foundation to building machines. But all the things Pre said and, and Blake said, I agree. I mean, I think you need layers of abstraction. And I think there's even a question of, at what point is a gate so complicated that a developer is never going to touch it or understand it anyway? Is that a thousand? Uh, you know, is it a hundred thousand? Is it a million? Because you hear people, you know, the press goes crazy with all these stories about you know millions of qubit machines and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, if you had it, you know, my question is, who would program it? Because that sounds really difficult based on where we're at and where we're trying to go. Right. And how do you well, benchmark or validate an outcome, right? So as, right, as you get exactly. some more complex circuits, you're not, even the largest supercomputers are, are struggling, right? And you, you can say, well, I want, you know, six months of time on this system. And sure, somebody might give you that for one circuit, but not regularly. So well, how do you know what your computing well, is actually real? <laughs> Well, Pri, Pri, I think you know the I think you know the answer to that, which is I write a classical solver that's highly optimized, but then I don't optimize the quantum components. <laughs> sure, not, not an apples to apples. That's a joke, but yeah, exactly. I mean, the benchmarking is is something that's missing that is a hugely going to be hugely impactful to developers and to enterprise developers, especially trying to build solutions. So, so if we're at that that early stage. I'm curious. Um, why are you involved now? Before the you know big, you know kind of mainstream inflection point, you know when you go back to the mobile space, early when when Jobs unveiled the iPhone and said, "Wow, you can use web style technologies to build apps for it." That was a level of abstraction that 23 million developers could say, "Okay, I can use this now." And you just said, "We're not there yet." So so why well, spend it, time with it now? I mean. Well it, well, it wasn't, right? Because remember what, what Steve said, right? So he said, there's not going to be any apps. And if there are, you're going to get them from us, right? And, and the way, what we'll let you do is we'll let you do stuff that already happens on the web. And so there, there was a little bit of a, of a disconnected ecosystem there that, that they got over much faster than we will in quantum. But why am I here? The best way to invent the future, you know, to, to predict the future is to be part of the, the invention of it. So we are looking you know, for most of the people on the team, this is our third startup together building large scale, you know, kind of platforms. And we wanted something that was a big challenge. We are not trying to sell a company in a year, or flip it or do some other thing. Like this is, this is, this is our last startup. And we want to do something impactful on humanity. Like chaotic moon was for fun and profit. It was awesome. Honest dollar helped, you know, change savings in, in America, which was great. We found out the mythical founder is kind of this myth. We needed a big problem space that had a lot of problems that was disconnected from the normal kind of ODA feedback loop that happens. And quantum's there. I mean, most of the people mach building machines aren't actually talking to developers. They're talking to physicists who can download development tools and, and they're playing the role of developers. And I think what you're gonna see is when you reach that, okay, we've got a purpose for it, and now we want it, it's gonna blow up. When you see that inflection point in this, you're gonna quickly find that, you know, software developers, not necessarily the greatest physicist, and physicists, not all the greatest software developers either, right? It's like, you know, a physicist downloading a, you know, PyTorch or something and, and saying like, we're ready to ship this is equivalent of, you know, I wrote quantum computing for babies. So clearly I am a quantum physics expert, right? And that is not, nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, this is the moment to be involved, to drive this to a point where it's not uh, exclusive, it's inclusive, to drive it to a point where it's not 200 people who can program the machines, it's, you know, Two million people. Um, all of the things that will make you know the world a better place. I believe this is the first real leap, you know. And then in the next ten years, computing will change more than it has in the last hundred. I believe that you know quantum is the thing I'm placing the bet on as being that exotic computing technology that brings about that change. And and you know I've got young kids and I want to see the world be a better place. And so why I'm would you not take your experience your and go here. in there? I'm sure. going to put words in your mouth here and see if you agree with it. It sounds like you think that that quantum is a truly revolutionary change in, in computing technology. 100%. I mean, I think we're stepping away from, 
a lot of the classical von Neumann type stuff. I think it provides a, a, a bunch of, I think it's a limited problem set, but I think those are really big problems that are super important <laughs> to, to kind of the human condition, if you will. And yeah, the, that's what drives us to get into this. That's what's driving us to, to, to try to do this. And that's why we're playing more of a, even though we're a company, we've got investors and we're for profit, we look more like a, an open source project, just trying to get as many people involved and as, as many people collaborating as possible, right? And, and try to be a catalyst to really bring about that, that change. Priyam, Blake, would you agree with that assessment? This is, this is revolutionary change, not evolutionary change? Priyam, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I want to add to the, the point with you know people being interested in programming quantum computers that don't have physics backgrounds. I see a lot of computer science students here at Harvard say, hey, I'm a really talented computer scientist. I've, I've interned with you know companies and, and uh, I want to know the bare minimum amount of physics such that I can start programming a quantum computer. And uh, that's an interesting experience to see some of those students enter um, the, the field and, and actually realize how how much you need to know about the hardware. And I think we'll see a major change from that in, in the near future. And yeah, you know, we're already seeing, I think, uh, a lot of valuable problems being solved on small term uh, quantum devices. This is a, a really nice uh, uh, result and, and paper from, from Bravi and, and the, the IBM folks that was just announced in Nature Physics. I think that we, we know that near term devices will show us a quantum advantage. We know that. Um, you know, there are problems that people have been trying to solve for decades. There are problems in condensed matter, in, in chemistry, holy grail problems that are now actually within reach. And you, 10 years ago, you'd have said, hmm, sure, someday we'll have a quantum computer and life will be better, but that's that's not going to happen. So we got to keep going on this, you know, trajectory we're on. And I think we're on a fundamentally different trajectory now. So, yeah. Go ahead, Blake. So, um before I ask my next question, I just want to let the folks that are online know that if you have questions that you want to ask, uh, you can ask them in the Q&A uh, panel, and uh, we'll get a chance to, uh, to, to, to put them up to our panelists uh, when we get a little bit further into uh, in today's session. But I want to, to go back to, to pre what you just said about the quantum advantage. Anybody want to care to hazard a prediction as to what type of time frame we're looking at until we see the first quantum advantage for a specific workload? Is it two years? Is it five years? Is it seven years? What do you think? And I'm not sure. The, what we, the problem is that we don't know exactly how powerful a quantum machine needs to be in order to get to quantum advantage. Uh, we've committed to and have been on a track of doubling quantum volume every, every year. Uh, we just uh, put up our uh, made a publicly available uh, first uh, machine with a quantum volume of 32 um, back in April. And already since that first one went up, we now have eight machines with quantum volume of 32 that are available uh, in the IBM quantum experience. Um, and we continue to, to, to march along that path of doubling. Um, you know, at what, at what point do we, do we, is it a powerful enough to machine for quantum advantage? I'm, we're not sure, but, um, uh, I, would, I would say personally, I'd be surprised if we have to get all the way to fault tolerance uh, to find a single application where uh, you can do something with advantage, whether from its time, cost, or whatever, uh, against a classical resource. I mean, I, I think it's an unfair question, Jeffrey, because you're you're asking Thomas Watson in 1943, like, hey, how many think computers do you think the world will need? And he's going to be like, four. Like oh, no more than four, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, I mean, that's the thing is, I think Blake made a good point. It's like if you're in this industry, if you want to be a developer in this industry, it needs to be a long term kind of play, a long term vision you have. Because what I always tell people is, you know, it's like that old Viking saying about sales, right? Pessimist thinks it's twenty years out, and the optimist thinks it's three years out. And the reality is, if you want to be involved in it, you should be preparing now. Because all I can tell you is, at some point between tomorrow and some future tomorrow. Blake and his team or Pre and her team or somebody is going to connect all the right pieces and that is going to go up and you're going to hit that quantum advantage. And when that happens, it will be too late to be like, now I'm very interested in being heavily involved in this space because I think it's going to take oh, off incredibly I'll fast. Translate, I'll translate that to say you think there's going to be a very steep inflection curve once we hit that, in, in, that, that quantum advantage point. Look, my, my, I'm writing a white paper on it now. My, my prediction is the inflection point based on 
you know, 100 years of, of computing technology is going to be steeper than any inflection point we have ever seen. It's going to make the internet hitting corporate America look silly. It's going to look like that took forever for them to, to adopt by comparison. It's going to be a very, very, very steep inflection point. I mean, I, I think this actually is connected a bit to the developer experience we've been talking about, right? Uh, those of us that build hardware understand that the most critical thing that's that's preventing us from, from reaching quantum advantage is the quality of the hardware. And so our first tools we built were really focused at those domain experts to giving them the tools that they need to build better hardware. And that's an important audience. We, like, we will continue to make better and better tools to serve that audience. But uh, as pre mentioned, like people are doing applications research with the devices that exist today and are finding, you know, they maybe can't yet solve a, system, a problem better than they could with a, with a classical resource, but they can solve problems. And they're starting to figure out like what the limitations are, how they can squeeze out the most utility out of the devices that exist today. And, and then they're getting ready for the devices that will exist tomorrow. And so we're starting to build tools that, that try to lower these barriers to entry for those people that are doing applications that are doing applications development, right? Not the domain experts, but a new audience. And we want the, the, the tools, we don't want them to have to learn uh, the everything about quantum computing in order to be able to, to get started. So our team um, is actually, with our last Kiskit release, made, made, made a first step towards a vision of, 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 of really bringing the tools to uh, the language that an application developer understands. And I don't necessarily just mean a programming language, but really the, the language of the problem they're trying to solve. So um, actually, Amanda, could you pull up uh, the graphic uh, on the, how it works for the optimization module? So in our last uh, Kiskit release, we, we introduced a new optimization module. Uh, and the, the idea here was to, to try to reach out to this new audience of developers that can, can program, uh, they, can, they can write their program by describing the problem that they want to solve, in this case, an optimization problem. So they can write down uh, like a quadratic formula. They can write down some description of, of the constraints of, the, of their optimization problem. They can choose uh, uh, different solvers, in both quantum solvers and classical solvers, because a lot of these developers are trying to answer this question exactly like, what is the value today? How does, this, how does the quantum work versus the classical? But based on that choice of, of solver type, they send that workload to the IBM cloud, and then we distribute it to the appropriate quantum or classical hardware and deliver the, the result back. So I think this is maybe the first time that you can use a, a gate-based quantum computer where you, you program it just at the level of what is the, 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 the at the problem uh, interface as opposed to at the circuit interface. So this is a level of abstraction above the circuit. Absolutely. I mean, for the, for this for this particular case, like. Um, I mean, you can compare different solution methods, methodologies, but you're not actually programming gates. Um, right. You're, you're so, programming your problem. So what I hear you doing here is starting to talk about the abstractions in the quantum world that create the language that, that we'll end up talking about as, as we write software uh, as developers. So we've got circuits, um, we've got uh, you know these 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 um, higher level constructs as well for specific domains like optimization. Do these things end up becoming you know open source GitHub libraries? Do they become um, things that you get in a quantum app store? How how do developers begin to to share this this sort of information or, or take advantage of it? I mean, open source I think is a critical piece to accelerating these kinds of developments because. Uh, we want these tools to be available to the broadest audience possible, and 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 open source is a, a great accelerator for making that happen uh, at, on the fastest time scales. Um, you know, we're a long way off from like the app store experience where uh, on my phone I can get an app that takes advantage of quantum resources. But I think we're 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 not that far away from the developer equivalent of that, which is you know. Uh, package management systems that I can just say, you know, pip install or brew install some package, which is a, a quantum uh, library for for some application domain. Um, and so, like, you know, the goal is uh, to come back to something where you said at the beginning about like the other I like the equivalent of the iPhone experiences today, right? I might be an iPhone developer and I want to develop a new app that needs to like an augmented reality app, right? That tracks like, I want to track the position of a basketball. That itself is a non-trivial machine vision task, right? But we don't ask every iPhone developer to be a machine vision expert. They just, they, they plug in into Xcode that they want to use ARKit, which is Apple's augmented reality solution. And off they go, like they get, they get something which can do that thing uh, without them being a, a, like a machine vision expert. 
we need to get to that point, and I, and I don't think it's that far away, where a, a, a developer can use quantum resources without having to be an expert in quantum computing. Yeah, and, and that's super important, that inflection point, right? I agree 100%. If you think back to 2007, okay, there are 400 of us a week later with iPhones and people hacking on them. When you think about that, it went to tens of thousands almost instantly, right, within six months to a year. And then over the course of 10 or 11 years, you get to 23 million people who are, who are doing that. And that mass of developers being involved drives exactly what Blake just said. And that's part of what we really want to be a part of driving, which is, you know, if you look at something like Shor's algorithm, okay, there's five steps. But you know, step four is where the quantum, you know, the non-deterministic magic is, right? I mean, I could write an iPhone app to stick with that analogy that could tell you if it's an even or odd number so fast, it'd be a waste of time and money to run that on a, on a supercomputer or a quantum computer. Uh, so you know, Blake makes a really good point. I think Pre, uh, you know, and I have have a similar view on that as well. I'd love to hear what what her opinion is on that. But it's like you have to have a mass of developers to do that. To do that, that's where quantum computing faces its biggest challenge when it gets out into what I call kind of out of the lab into the real world, and all of a sudden there's a million developers who are like, hey, I got a question for you. Why doesn't it do this? Or why do I have to do that? And it's like, there's gonna be a lot of work that needs to be done at that point. And that's that's gonna be a, a big, big wake up call for, for everyone, including us in quantum computing. Because think developers rarely use things in the exact way they were intended to be used. Right. They will sure. find more. They will find the bugs. They will find the weaknesses. They will find the problems. And so the faster we can get to that point, Blake is described and the better. I mean, pre, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we've uh, certainly noticed, uh, you know, especially as, as we're um, taking some of the circuits we run on, on superconducting to, to trap tie and realize that um, some things don't, don't work the same way. And, you know, you're, forget about developers breaking things in, in new ways. Uh, even experienced people break things in ways they didn't anticipate and have to call an engineer and say, hey, how do I fix this? And I think if we expect you know a million developers entering the community to uh, have answers from a, an expert engineer, that's probably not a very scalable model. So uh, something that could be useful um, is of course having better simulators that people can try uh, more things on, especially uh, simulators that allow you to replicate some of the noise associated with, with current hardware, see how, how things are performing. Um, also simple stuff like getting runtime estimates, getting uh, you know, uh, a year or nay, like is your circuit going to actually fit on the device you're trying to, to run it on? That's a, a problem I've seen uh, a lot of people have. Uh, they have a, a beautiful idea and they assume that it can run on this really tiny device. And you're like, mm, that that could have been done slightly differently. So I think there's like different levels to, to uh, you know, how, how do we make it easier for developers who are entering uh, in the field to, to get there? Of course, uh, some of the educational uh, content that, that IBM has uh, developed is, of course, very helpful towards that as well. Uh, you're introducing people to how do you do open quantum systems on uh, a quantum device. I think uh, you know you guys are the only ones who, who make that available. Um, or, or how do you think about various uh, you know, types of molecules and, and mapping them onto, onto a quantum device? So I don't you know, want to say here that those are the only ways that, that people would um, use a, a quantum device. But um, giving people an idea of you know your problem is well suited for a device that looks like this, or your problem is better suited for a device that looks like that, like a simple answer like that might be uh, might be helpful. So, I don't know if I answered any of your questions, but you did. You did. Um, actually, I had a, a, a question from um, Michael Brooks in, in, in the UK, and I'm going to go ahead and ask that here. Um, Pre, you mentioned that some things are less easy to implement on the superconducting circuit. And, and, and the question is, how far are developers from you know, not having to necessarily worry about what they're doing and whether or not it's going to work in a quantum environment or not? So where are the, when do we see guideposts that, that kind of tell us what workloads are going to work or what loads, workloads are not going to work or that we don't necessarily right. have to care about matching that? Right. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not only, I guess, the, the workload, but also, you know, 
trap time is all to all that has its own challenges. Uh, not all supercontracting systems can or will be all to all. Um, so how do you discretize a problem such that it can uh, one on, on those different uh, topologies? I think that's uh, um, an interesting question. We, you can imagine, you know, coming up with simple figures of merit with with known types of circuits and saying, you know, this type of circuit in our experience has run better on a, a system that that you know looks as follows. But um, I don't know in terms of very very general guideposts if you could say, you know, if you have a circuit that looks like this, it will always run on uh, a superconducting circuit with with X fidelity. I think that answer might be harder than saying. Hey, you might want to simplify this part of your circuit uh, in order to actually run on on the device you're trying. So, well, we have an explosion of different types of machines, and you know that uh, you know there's going to be this complexity of matching circuits to to hardware, or or you know will we get to essentially the quantum equivalent of of uh, Intel, you know, Spark and and uh, and and uh, you know uh, ARM pretty quickly. Uh, it's a, a tricky question. I'm trying to see how to answer it without uh, making all of my colleagues angry at me. Um, <laughs> but I suspect, <laughs> this is my personal view, that there will be certain problems that will run just fine on a variety of hardware and some that might be more specialized to particular types of hardware. And that's just associated with the physics that is underlying that type of hardware. And this will be especially important as we try and map problems from condensed matter and chemistry onto, onto some of these devices. We'll see that not everything is ideal or even possible for all kinds of, of problems. But uh, yeah. we don't have that kind of experience yet. There are only a few different trap ion systems out there. Uh, it's, it's very um, hard to, to get access to those, and not many of them have gone the route that, that IBM did with, with making... Uh, at least the, the smallest devices available very, very broadly. Um, so there's a, a whole lot more that needs to be done in a simulator before you can actually try it on, um, on real hardware. And of course, systems like uh, cold atom or, or photonic circuits are really, really niche. So getting time on those is uh, very expensive and almost right. uh, unaffordable for um, you know the, the average developer out there. So the, the best you can hope to offer to them is say, Hey, if you write something that works on this genre of systems, we can get you to a point where it runs on other systems, and that's uh, something that uh, you know Star Battle My Group is trying to uh, accomplish at the moment. You also want to tell people, especially uh, you know a customer like the Air Force, that if you write and and you know spend a lot of energy developing uh, something that that is is nobody else can see or nobody else can touch that runs at this particular type of hardware and it goes away that that work is not all wasted so these are questions that have yeah. uh, uh, come up in many conversations i'm sure worley has uh, more to say about yes. this. i mean that, that's, a, that's a that's a really i agree you kind of threw her the question bomb there which i was i was kind of glad for but that's like that's that's a little it's a, it's a it's not an unfair question but it's a very pointed question but the thing is think, think of it this way you know I have on my desk an iPhone, an iPad, and a 16-inch laptop, okay? And those things can all do email, and they can all surf the web, and they can do them really well. But I can't open Xcode and compile a big program on my iPhone. And I probably don't want to do that on my iPad either, right? So as, as these technologies advance and as the experimentation advance, right, there's going to be unlikely discovery. It's going to be like Quantum is going to be like the Wright brothers, right? It's like they didn't discover flight. There were hundreds of people working on that, right? But they made a three-axis, you know, device, and all of a sudden now, you know, they didn't crash, and that helped everybody. There's going to be hundreds of those in quantum computing, and it's going to take it in directions that none of us can imagine. It would be, it would be foolish to try. And there's even already 16 startups I'm following who are making quantum processors for specific applications, exactly like pre-described, right. where they're like, this is just going to be quantum for this one very you know, vertical industry, or even for a subsection in a vertical industry. And so, so you're going you know, right I think where my follow-up was. We're going to see- I, I, I kind of, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of anticipating your follow-up. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah I, and, I was, and, and I, I kind of, <laughs> yep. Does that become Go a specific hardwired uh, piece of hardware, or is that something that you can configure and tune 
to match that workload? Blake, I mean, you're probably in the middle of this. What, you know, I, I think there's both. I think there's software configured systems and uh, you know software configured quantum systems in the future. And I, th I think there's you know systems that are very, very specific. I mean, even look at supercomputing today and, and high performance computing. There are computers built in on Wall Street just for doing trades or a type of trade. So we've seen this throughout computing history, right? And I don't think quantum will be any different. I hope that there's as many hardware and software solutions available as possible. Because again, I think this is the first really big step that we've made in computing technology. I think the material science is needed to go to Mars, the research and drug discovery to, to combat cancers and things like that, the environment, all of these things. Now you're talking about the computing horsepower to really address those. And so, you know, the, the more the merrier. But I mean, as far as what that ends up looking like, I mean, I think it it still follows some fundamental development rules that classical computing has followed, which is you do have specified, right? You have FPGAs and you have TPUs and GPUs and you, you have things. Think about GPUs. We talk about GPUs now like they're great for processing, but that's not what they were made for, right? You know what I mean? They were somebody said, whoa, these processors on these graphic cards are super awesome and cheap. Let's string them together. And there will be people who do that. There will be the hackers and painters of quantum, if you will, right? And they'll do those same things. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if all this comes to pass. Uh, but I would say the, the, the specific focus today, I think, is a bit of um, it, it's, it's related to this pre-fall tolerant era, right? Like, we're, we're kind of programming machines where I have to count every instruction. And, you know, it's like the, the really, really early days of, 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 compu of classical computing where I only had like one kilobyte of memory, if that. And so I had to like every bit count it, right? Uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of there. Uh, and, and, yep. and, and that sort of forces the programmer to fit in very narrow boxes, right? Like in order to get something to, to work. Um, but as the machines become more capable uh, and these abstraction layers become, uh, you know, I don't worry about their cost. Um, then, then, then I think uh, that will change the world a, a lot. Another thing that will happen, though, is like once we get yeah, once we get the fault tolerance, once we're not talking about operations on physical qubits, but operations on error corrected qubits, uh, error correction comes with a big overhead and cost of like as a hardware developer of how many qubits I need and, and the, the the control system that I have to build in order to 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 correct the errors as the system is executing. That come, but most error correction comes with, come with an enormous advantage, which is that the connections, the virtual connections between error corrected qubits are often all to all or, or very, very cheaply all to all. I can move qubits around. I can teleport them around on this logical lattice of, of qubits uh, for almost no additional cost based uh, above what I do for error correction. So when we get to that regime, I think uh, we'll become a lot less focused on on needing to specialize the hardware for this application or that application and so on. I want to remind uh, those of us that are listening uh, that uh, you can ask questions. And we're kind of coming to the end of the, the, the questions that I was dying to know. Uh, but I'm going to have one more uh, uh, here. And, um, and, and that's what's the most common misconception about quantum development that, that you've run into? Um, Pri, I'll start with you. Oh my gosh. Um, I think the biggest is uh, that this is going to take me two years to even do my first calculation or first circuit. It's, it's the expectation that the, the first step is going to be on the order of say yours rather than you know, like, hey, go get Kiskit going. You're in good shape. So. Worley, how about you? I, I, I mean, I, I think it's that, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I agree with Pre. I see that where people are like, they're looking for the like, hey, I downloaded the Apple Dev Kit and I did Hello World, boom, it all compiled. And it's like, ah, oh, it's a little more complicated than that. So I agree with that. But I think in addition to that, it's this view by some developers that quantum computers will be like the thing that you program, it'll be just on those quantum machines. And I think we all see that there's going to be a, a blended architecture, right? There's going to be the classical components aren't going away. Um, and the, the way I like to think about it is, 
you know, think about traveling across the U.S. 100 years ago, right? Uh, you did it by wagon. It took six to eight weeks. Somebody died. Maybe you ate them. Who knows? And then, you know, all of a sudden we had trains and you did it in a week, right? Uh, but no matter how far you go, eventually you reach an ocean. And so now we have air travel. Well, air travel didn't get rid of trains around the world, right? Uh, you know, and, and quantum computing, I don't think is going to get rid of massive hunks of classical infrastructure. And, and, I, and I say that from a pretty, having worked at Tivoli and IBM and BMC, I know how many mainframes in the world are still running very critical components of yeah. all of our lives. So if we haven't been able to get rid of all of those yet, then it, you know it's probably going to be a very long, long tail for that to happen. And I think that's the thing is people, you know, people are like, oh, I'll do quantum computing. That's it's like, well, you still you're going to have to know all of this, right? You're going to be programming across infrastructure. You're going to be doing it probably with some smart routing system on what resources you're using at what time, and, and, it, and it is going to be new. But it's going to be things you need to know in addition to that for now. And then like Blake said, I think he made the best point of the talk, which is eventually there'll be that Apple AR kit or whatever. And we'll say, hey, I'm writing code. I've got this kind of complex area of the code. The computer's going to find it and say, this is computationally complex. It's computationally complex in a way that if I add a few variables, the evaluation time soars, I can take that out, send it to a quantum machine, get a reply back, and then continue programming, right? I think there's going to be a lot more of that than maybe people imagine. I think people maybe are putting too much of a burden on the, on the quantum system and not understanding that that's a specialized tool for a specialized purpose. Yeah, just to add on to that, I mean, there are certain problem domains where we know where we don't actually expect any advantage from from having quantum resources available, and and given that, I mean, we have to understand that classical computers are both cheap and fast uh, at problems that they're good for, and so like it won't make sense. Like you'll actually be slower in some cases for for choosing the quantum resource over the over over the classical one, and so you know we predict that very far into the future, these blended environments, these hybrid environments, where you have access to both quantum and classical resources will be the will be the norm. Yeah, Jeffrey, you know, I, I think just to tag on to like think of it this way. As a developer, you want me to do something for you. So there's three factors. You can have it, it can be good, it can be fast, or it can be cheap. And you, you get to pick any two. And as a developer, I get to pick the other one. And that won't change with quantum. I mean if a quantum computer is a million times faster at a task that has a minor impact on return on investment or doing something, and a classical system is, you know, a, cost a million times less, and it, it'll take longer, but it'll get the job done. Enterprises will still default to that classical system, right? They're not, they're, they're, they, especially now. I mean, enterprises ten years ago had more of an R and D flair than they do today. Today, they're moving their stuff into clouds, even though. You know, I thought that was the 90s, as I'm sure you did, Jeffrey. But, you know, there's still people making that transition. There, there's a lot of ways to, to look at this that say, look, it's going to change the world. It's going to be one of the most impactful things that's happened in computer science ever, right? Definitely in our lifetimes. Uh, but there's going to be a whole bunch of factors to get it adopted that we're going to have to address. And one of those is exactly what's Blake saying. We're going to have to identify where it has an advantage, where it doesn't. And we're going to have to build systems that automate and guide people through that, including developers with abstraction. Because if we don't, we're not going to have the adoption we need to reach any kind of critical impact. That's right. I guess, Jeffrey, one of the things that I'm often surprised about is the number of people that believe that quantum programming today is done only, only with simulators. Um, and uh, Certainly, there's a lot of value to having simulators. Having better simulators with good noise models is is extremely value, valuable. I, I don't deny that. But I mean, real quantum hardware exists, right? There's uh, 18 uh, quantum systems available today on the IBM Quantum Experience, um, and people that are doing applications research often, um, you know, have to pay attention to if they want to get their, their their problem to work. They have to pay attention to some details of that of that resource. You know, they need to. Uh, these these devices today are have noise. They have imperfections, and so like they need to employ techniques sometimes to to mitigate those errors. And if I can't capture that that behavior exactly with the simulator, the only way to really find out if it works is 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 on real hardware. And so you know, having real hardware today uh, is I think a critical. You know, it, it's something that exists, and it's critical to actually finding out whether or not your idea really has value. So. One of the questions that we have uh, from from the listeners today is is about the nature of of 
the first quantum, recognizably quantum workloads. Um, any sort of prediction as to what the first quantum powered apps might end up being or quantum, you know, enriched apps maybe I should say, given the way that our discussion is going? So, I mean, there's a few domains that we suspect will uh, have early early use of quantum machines, early successful use of quantum machines. And those are kind of in the domains of quantum simulation, particularly chemistry. Um, there's uh, systems that take advantage of, of linear algebra, because that's something that quantum machines kind of do natively. And so you, that often happens in, in optimization problems uh, or finance problems, which are also tend to be optimization problems. Um, and and, and so, like those are the those are the domains that we're looking at first, effectively for for finding uh, finding value of quantum resources. So here's another one. So, despite the enthusiasm expressed by um, those of us on the panel today, it still sounds like uh, quantum advantage is is far off, years off, and the mainstream quantum computing even. If, uh, around a niche problem set is at least a decade away. Is this wrong? Decade feels like it might be a little bit too long to me, but I'll let the experts weigh in. Decade feels a bit pessimistic to me. Yeah, look, as the, you know, I have two amazing panelists that are both far more quantum experts than me. So looking at it from a pure 30 years of seeing new tech coming down and doing the development, I think 10 years sounds very pessimistic. Now, is it, what most people imagine as a quantum computer in 10 years? Is it a full general purpose machine, whatever? Who knows? Um, but I don't think you're going to wait 10 years. I think it's more in the two to five year range to where there's things that start to become economically advantageous to enterprises. And it'll probably be in chemistry and material science. And they, I mean, I agree with what, you know, the direction Blake was going there. Um, but it's like, as you see those advantages, the, the, the reason to get involved in quantum now is it will not be like, hey, you know, Amazon has a website and Barnes and Noble's like, no worries, we can take a few years, we'll wait, we'll see how that works. Okay, now we have a website, right? And, and, and we know how that turned out. It will be, you know, a much more dramatic inflection point in a much, much shorter period of time. You, you, if you're in aerospace and your competitor is using quantum and you've decided to take a wait and see approach, it's not going to be something where we see it 24 or 36 months out. It's literally just going to be like, oh, IBM released a new version of KidsKit and a new machine, and it's magic. And if you've been in that path for workflow, then you're taking advantage of that tremendously. And if you haven't, then you're a year or two behind the moment that transition happens. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's like any other technology, right? Look at the iPhone of 10 years ago. Would you have said, hey, do you think iPhones will do augmented reality in 10 years? I mean, who knows, right? The developers, the users, they'll drive that. I mean, one of the weak points of quantum computing is we don't have enough people from outside of quantum computing asking the tough questions, doing the feature requests, you know, pushing it forward, in, in, in my opinion. But it's like, you know, 10 years, I, I would agree with Blake. I think that's really pessimistic. And I think that that we don't know and you won't know. It'll be, you'll read about it, and oh, literally out of nowhere, it'll be picked up. And, and if you want an example of that, think of machine learning, uh, learning. Machine learning was all the rage when I was getting out of high school in the 80s, right? In the late 80s. And then it didn't do anything, it didn't do anything, didn't do anything. And then look at where, just in Google Zeitgeist or whatever, all of a sudden, like, something worked, and phew, it just skyrocketed. And if you were on that train, that was great for you. And if you weren't, then you're still playing catch up, you know, you know six or seven years later. I think that's especially true for you know people working on quantum chemistry problems that use quantum computers, um, folks working in in predicting new molecules, new pharmaceuticals. They do anything to get that ten percent, five percent advantage. It's not, you know. Um, so I think if somebody's able to uh, make very high fidelity um, predictions or, or predict something, you you really wouldn't have. Uh, incrementally improved on using your, your classical resources, uh, you're suddenly at, at what I would call an existential uh, point there. So um, so I agree with Raleigh on that, you know, 10 years is uh, very pessimistic. Uh, 
know. I tend to be really well, optimistic, so I won't make a prediction here, but uh, much sooner but than I, that. Think, I think one of the unanimous I, I, takeaways I heard that pre, I'm hearing. I heard Pre first. say next year. I heard Pre say next year. That's what I heard. She said, I'm not going to make a prediction. I'm really optimistic. I hear, I hear uh, August 2021. I'm going to tweet that out right quick for you. Don't worry. Hang on. Just give me a second. <laughs> no worries. I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the consistent things I'm hearing here, though, is that, you know, if somebody is used to being a fast follower and saying, you know, I'll wait until the technology gets to the point where where it's it's proven and then I'll learn it, that might not be a strategy that works as well in this particular space. Right. First movers seem to well, have more of an advantage given the nature of the change. Exactly. And I think, um, you know, there, there are examples from other parts of quantum technology, quantum communication being one of them, where you, you can show there's unconditionally secure communication that lies on, on one side, right? So that's not something you're going to wait for somebody else to show before you, you think about it. Because once that access is out there, that's, that's not something you can really catch up to. So I think quantum information, quantum computing, it's, it's, it has some parallels with, with the communication side of things, not exactly the same, but you know, there, there is a, a step change that once you have access to, um, say a, a large enough quantum resource where you figured out how to do a valuable problem, uh, you're also much less likely to, to, um, you know, share that immediately. For example, if you, you know, found a way to do a large biomolecule, um, <laughs> The, the, the era of uh, pandemics, I feel like biomolecules is something a lot of us are thinking about more than uh, we would have normally. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's advantage that somebody else might find extremely hard to overcome, if ever. So uh, that's, right. and I, I think that's, that's why there's uh, interest from, from people who normally would not be early adopters of uh, technology in, in this space, at least. Well, and, and, and we just think about, her. you know, to, just right quick to stick to the transportation thing, think about all of the horses in use when cars came along. And what were cars? They were pro prohibitively expensive. Uh, they, they weren't as reliable. There were all these things. And then as commoditization happened, as, you know, democratization of that, you know, the, the, all of the things we know about automotive history, it literally, if you look at the time where they overlap, uh, that's a very, very small amount of time. It was just like, pew, you know, horses are in fields and, and everybody has some sort of automobile. When you look at it from a historical perspective, I think it's the same thing. I don't think you can, you can't be a fast follower. You have to either be placing a bet in it now or deciding to take the risk of not being involved in it at the point where something that is clearly a tremendous evolutionary change in computing happens. And if that's a risk you want to take with your your business, that's totally fine, right? I mean, people did that with the internet. They've done it with every technological advantage. The only problem is that as we move further in the future, these changes become bigger. The delta between the existing and the new, the incumbent and the new become larger. And it happens much over a much shorter period of time. So I just, I, I think, you know, again, I, I, you know, not to pick on Barnes and Noble or whatever, but if you think of a Barnes and Noble board or Amazon example, it's like, oh, cute, selling books on the internet. They'd be like, oh, wow, they've, they've got this new fancy computer. And then you'll be like, shit, we don't have one. What are we going to do? Right? Like, you can't so, catch up because now video, I'm a financial internet, trading person. That work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it, 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 just go back 10 years and tell somebody, hey, in the future, there'll be a pandemic and we'll only meet on video and people would think you were nuts. So, I mean, this is going to be a million, a trillion times the, the impact as any of those. So I just want to so, uh, tack on one thought here, which is that uh, I do think that inflection point will happen. And, and my colleagues at IBM, we're, we're working uh, every day to, to make the harbor better, to, to, to hasten that the, the arrival of that point from a harbor standpoint. But it'll also be a mistake to, to have the hardware capable of it, of, of quantum advantage, and not realize it because we didn't have the software ecosystem uh, ready to, to try different applications, try different spaces, to, 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 to try to find quantum advantage on the hardware that exists. And so that's why like we're not waiting. Uh, we're, we're working with partners. Uh, such as my colleagues on the panel today, to develop to develop that and grow that software ecosystem to to, to make the soft, make the, the make the systems uh, accessible to a broader audience, so that we can we can find quantum advantage by uh, by by trying different uh, spaces of, of applications. Uh, 
of application areas. I want to thank you all today. This has been awesome. Um, I've gotten a lot of my burning questions answered. It's been very edifying for me. I hope for the other folks that have been listening in today. Um, thank you for sharing your uh, your experience and your um, um, your wisdom with us. Yeah, thank you for having us here. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having us.